Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day, this Palm Sunday here at the beginning of Holy Week. We are separated again this week as we will be for weeks to come. But let us remember that at this time when we gather for worship, that we are joined. We're joined through the, the fellowship, if you will, of our worship. So do not feel that you are alone or a stranger. We're all in this together. Thanks be to God. I wanted to, uh, to take special note that uh, at the beginning of Holy Week, as you know, this, it is our custom to do Maundy Thursday service and Friday Tenebrae service before we head into Easter. And we will be doing those. So on Thursday, we will have a Maundy Thursday that a service that will feature communion. And on Friday, we will do our uh, Good Friday Tenebrae service and uh, extinguish the lights uh, for that evening. I wanted to also mention that Rachel King and Amy Backstrom, at Backstrom have been working especially hard to keep us as a first uh, Presbyterian family connected. Uh, young and old, uh, just know that you are loved by our staff, even as we are grateful for your love for us. Video messages and encouraging words and beautiful hymns are some of the ways that we are connecting virtually. And all those videos are available on the First Pres website. That's firstpresworcester.org. And also on the Facebook page. And both of those addresses are listed at the bottom of the bulletin. I must... Uh, lift up uh, another person in our midst, and that is Jacob Gooch, and say how grateful we here are and how grateful you all uh, are feeling as well that we have his expertise during this time. So now let us prepare our hearts to worship God. The organ music today reflects the dichotomy of this Palm Passion Sunday. The prelude is chorale by the Belgian composer, Joseph Yongen. It takes the form of a three minute long crescendo, which for me conjures imagery of a long and majestic procession. The postlude is a chorale setting by J.S. Bach, one of his most highly ornamented, O man, bewail thy grievous fall. The text invites us to consider our own sins this week as we prepare to mark the sacrifice of Christ for us.
Hallelujah, Hosanna. Hosanna, Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Please join me in the call to worship. Humble and riding on a donkey, we greet you. Acclaimed by crowds and caroled by children, we cheer you. Moving from the peace of the countryside to the corridors of power, we salute you, compassionate one. You are giving the beasts of burden a new dignity. You are giving majesty a new face. You are giving those who long for redemption a new song to sing. With them, with heart and voice, we shout, Hosanna. Come, let us worship our God of healing and wholeness. Let us pray. We tell your story. We follow your footsteps. Lead us into Holy Week. We walk towards the city. We wait in the garden. Lead us onto holy ground. We journey towards death. We hope for new life. Lead us into holy joy. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. I'm sharing with you this morning a poem by Anne Weems from her collection entitled Kneeling in Jerusalem. The poem is called Holy Week. Holy is the week, holy, consecrated, belonging to God. We move from hosannas to horror with the predictable ease of those who know not what they're doing. Our hosannas sung, our palms waved. Let us go with passion into this week. It is a time to curse fig trees that do not yield fruit. It is a time to cleanse our temples of any blasphemy. It is a time to greet Jesus as the Lord's anointed one, to lavishly break our alabaster and pour perfume out for him without counting the cost. It is a time for preparation, the time to give thanks and break bread is upon us, the time to give thanks and drink of the cup is imminent, eat, drink, remember. On this night of nights, each one must ask, as we dip our bread in the wine, is it I? And on that darkest of days, each of us must stand beneath the tree and watch the dying, if we are to be there when the stone is rolled away. The only road to Easter morning is through the unrelenting shadows of Friday. Only then will the alleluias be sung only then will the dancing begin. Let us join our voices as we pray the prayer we have been taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Claudia's beautiful rendition of Pia Jesu is the perfect way to enter Palm Passion Sunday. The text we're going to hear today, first one from Matthew chapter 21, which is the Palm text. The second one will come from Matthew chapter 27, and that's the Passion text. Let us hear now these words as we prepare to enter this week. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, they brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, 
and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Matthew 27, verse 15. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? for he realized it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, Pilate's wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. On the face of it, the Palm Passion text we read today presents one of the enduring mysteries of the Christian story. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, the crowds were cheering, throwing palm branches in the road, shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. And yet, as the story unfolds, by the end of the week, the palm branch branches have given way to clubs and stones, and the crowd is shouting, crucify him. What happened? How did Jesus go from celebrity welcome to despised, condemned one in such a short time? Yet perhaps there is no mystery here, but a cold reality check. The crowd soon discovered that Jesus was not really on their side. Jesus was not going to deliver in the way they expected. Jesus was not going to be the leader for whom they had hoped. His countercultural message stated most uncomfortably, clearly, in the Sermon on the Mount, put him at odds with those who wanted clear and quick action against the aggressors and sinners of the day. To put it bluntly, the crowds of Palm Sunday discovered that Jesus would not be exclusively on their side. The Jesus who rode into Jerusalem that day would be on God's side, and that would put him on everybody's side. And being on everybody's side made him useless as a weapon of power. Among the variety of his followers in those days was a group known as the Zealots. Their deep hatred for Rome was well known. 
their methods of protest and sub subversion were violent. And they were looking for a Messiah who would lead their revolution. But Jesus' message of nonviolence and love of one enemies, one's enemies made him absolutely of no use to the zealots. There were religious leaders in that Palm Sunday crowd who were ready to stand with Jesus if he also stood for a strict interpretation of certain religious laws. But Jesus was always putting people ahead of the law, and especially the wrong kind of people, sinners and tax collectors, prostitutes and social outcasts, immigrants and asylum seekers. So, he was of no use to the religious leaders. He could not be counted on by them because he spent his time among the irreligious and even called them blessed, blessed above all those who strictly kept religious laws. Even his own followers could not pin him down. Peter, James, John were not looking for much beyond some heavenly reward for their faithfulness. But Jesus could only promise them the cross, the way of sacrifice and service for others. And eventually, faced with that stark reality, they too, in fa fear, abandoned and even denied him. The crowds of Jerusalem, who were sick and in need of healing, hungry and in need of feeding, enslaved and in need of freedom, soon realized that a Jesus who was headed to the cross was not going to come to their rescue. They turned on him because he seemed not to be turned toward them. Instead, he was turned toward God. After the Palm Sunday hopeful hosannas, when the immediate concerns of the gathered crowd were not satisfied, Jesus became an expendable commodity. And yet today, perhaps we should not be too critical of those Jerusalem crowds, for the welcome Jesus might receive in our midst this Palm Sunday may not be all that different. We have expectations and longings and needs, and some divine action on our behalf would certainly be in order. Were Jesus to ride in this morning, might we wave our palm branches? Might we sing our hosannas? And then, by week's end, not having our own needs and desires fulfilled, seeing no divine challenge to the overwhelming pain of the world, especially in the face of worldwide pandemic, might we also, like the Jerusalem crowd, become indifferent to Jesus' fate because he seems of no practical use to us? I offer this personal provocative thought to the beginning of our liturgical season called Holy Week. To me, in this time and in our place, there seems to be little universal urgency of response to our sacred biblical calls for godly justice, godly compassion, or godly loving kindness abroad in our land, let alone in all other lands. And in our personal lives, I do not think the God 
we wish were in control of all is the magic fairy we hope will grant us all our dreams. The religion challenging, the religion subsuming way of Jesus would have us give ourselves away for the good of others. This way would have us lose ourselves to be found. And yet, most profoundly, this way of Jesus will not take our side. This way of Jesus will be firmly planted on God's side, which means this way is on everyone's side, even those we hate, even those we might call enemies. Jesus will not support our partisan agendas or our petty prejudices. And so, as those palm-waving protagonists of Matthew's story discovered, he may be of as little use to us as he seems to have been to Matthew's crowd. We have a choice when confronted with Jesus to pick up stones to throw, or to wave palm branches. But the profound good news of our story is that whether pelted with rocks or cheered with palm branches, Jesus will continue to walk on his way to the cross and beyond. We see these palm branches laid down at the foot of the communion table. In the spirit of Palm Sunday, we might think of them as symbols of our personal needs, our partisan preferences, our fears in the face of profound uncertainties, our spoken and unspoken desires for divine presence in our lives. And though we may not get what we think we want from following the way of Jesus, by laying down our wishful palm branches, we may receive the unexpected mystery of coming Easter joy. And in the end, we may be given what we need for the life to which we all are called. We are here. We are called to live out a God-graced future for the healing and wholeness of all creation. And that future includes us. Thank you.
we have just sung the great promise of our faith. Our hope is in no other save in thee. And that is the one who leads us, who walks with us into this holy week. This holy week that will have its deathly and horrible parts to it. Many of the folks that are our fellow citizens are in great pain and sorrow and mourning. And that's why, especially on this Palm Passion Sunday, we must hold to the great hope that is in no other. Let us keep a sacred holy week so that we may faithfully arrive on a joyous Easter Sunday. As you leave the sanctuary this day, go knowing you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever, that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always, that together we are being empowered by Holy Spirit for faithful witness and loving service this and every day of our lives. And may God's hope and peace and love and great joy abide with you now and always. Amen.